in looking at this this morning, there are people that question themselves, constantly second-guessing themselves, wondering, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? Does God want me to do this? Does he want me to do that? And many times they just, they don't know the direction God wants them to go. And because they don't know, they question. And at first they question themselves, and then usually if they don't feel that they ever come to a, some type of closure on it, they'll start to question God. And then they start saying, are you even listening? Do you even know my situation? Do you even know what I'm going through? So they move from, God, I don't know what you want me to do. God, is this right? God, to, God, are you even listening? So at first they question themselves, then they question God. What we have to realize <clears throat> is that ever since Jesus came, Jesus' purpose in coming, yes, it was to save the lost, absolutely. Uh, it was also to destroy the works of the devil, because that's what it said. He came to destroy the works that he was manifested so that he might destroy the works of the devil. So we know there are different reasons he came, but they all fit into one kind of category. But the whole purpose of his coming to this earth really boils down to this. God wanted to be in union with man. He wanted a close union. He wanted a relationship, obviously. But he was going to the point where man had been separated from him and <clears throat> was always questioning and always having to say, what is your will? <clears throat> but when Jesus came, he showed us the will of God. He showed us by his life, number one. He showed us uh, by his teachings, number two. But we also see through the entire New Testament, we are told, don't be unwise, right? That was a King James way of saying, don't be stupid, right? He said, don't be unwise, but wise, knowing the will of the Lord. One of the main things that most people question God about is knowing God's will. And the one thing that God says we are to know, it says, having made known unto us his will. So his will, we know his will. It's in you. So the problem is not in God. The problem often is that we don't know how to access the knowledge of God's will, even though his will has been given to us. So, I mean, I've got, well, let's say, have you ever, uh, maybe from somebody or, so, let's not say a person, let's say a business. Somebody sends, a business sends you a letter and you see the business it's from and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, it's, They've sent me stuff before, and you're in no big hurry to open it, right? And you just kind of leave it sitting on the table. And then one day you walk by, and you see it, and you're kind of like, oh, you know what? I, I, I got a little time. I'll go and open You open it up, and it was saying, you know, contact us within seven days, and you get a free this. And you're like, have you ever noticed what day you open that on? The eighth day. Isn't that right? I and mean, it's always after, <laughs> right after it, it you know, expires. But... The answer was in there. Well, the answer to God's will is in you. But many people don't seek God's will. They don't try to determine God's will is a better way to say it until they're in such a problem that they have to, you know, somehow try to dig themselves out of it. And then all of a sudden they're crying out to God saying, God, show me your will. And he said, I showed you a long time ago. If you'd have been listening, yeah, you would have had rocky ground, rocky things going on, but you would have walked right on through it and you wouldn't have spent near as much time in it. Imagine if the Israelites, had they, they knew God's will. God's will was for them to go into the promised land to take the promised land. But because they didn't understand how that could happen and they looked at the circumstances over uh, what God had told them to do, because his will was clear. My, he, he told them, I want you to go into the promised land. This is the land I've given you. Go in and take it. He didn't say, go in and it's just going to be handed over. He said, go in and take it. Right? So they should have known there's going to be some type of resistance. But you had 12 of them go in. 10 come out saying, we can't do it. The two say, we can do it. And they spend the next 40 years wandering around. Do you realize they would have never had to spend 40 years in the wilderness if they had just moved into the promised land? <clears throat> so, now, the bad part was Joshua and Caleb also had to go in 40 years in the wilderness, wandering around with them. But later, when they finally, after 40 years, Joshua stands, or Caleb stands up and says, Listen, I'm 80 years old, and I've got more strength and more energy than I had 40 years ago. Now I want this land that God promised me, and I'm going to go take it. Amen. 
Amen. Why? Because God's promise is not dependent on your ability or your strength or your power or anything to do with you other than your obedience to step in and take it. Amen. I'm preaching way better than y'all are amen, and I can tell you. All right? Okay. This is good news. Amen? Amen. So, but too often uh, we question God's will. Well, maybe this, and, uh, you know, often we've had it taught to us differently. Well, God's will is this. God's will is that. It's this thing. And, and we, oh, that sickness, that's God's will. Oh, this, you know, this uh, bankruptcy, that's God's will. No, no. Uh, the, the idea is to get God's will, not what man says is God's will. Amen? And you find that out. No, number one, it's in you, but you find it out by going to the Word of God, finding what the Word of God says, and whenever you see the truth in the Word of God, it will witness with your spirit. Why? Because the one living in you is the one that authored it. Amen. And he's going to say, yeah, that's, that's right. And then you start moving in it. Now, so, but, uh, so just to start, now we're going to go, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 3 is the first one we're going to go to. Well, it's not the first one, but uh, it's one of the first. Then we're going to go to Matthew 13, then Mark 6, right? So, <clears throat> now, but before we go there, actually, if you want to turn to, since 1 Samuel is in the Old Testament, and many people don't know where that's at, I'll give you time to look for it, and while you're looking, I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 8, right? Romans chapter 8, it's all amazing chapter, as all the Bible is. But in verse 29, he says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So first off, we know right there, that's the will of God. God's will is that you be conformed to the image of his Son, right? First and foremost. And you say, but that's not God's will that I need to know. I need to know... What job does he want me to take? What house does he want me to, to buy or rent? What car does he want me to have? I need to know details today, right? And we're going to be talking about the will of God, I believe, uh, some of the rest of this year. And so hopefully I'll be able to bring some of these things out for you. But notice this. Number one, the number one thing that God said was that he wanted you to, you were predestinated to be conformed to the image of God or to the image of his son, all right? Now, Why? that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, notice, he didn't say, I want you to be conformed to the image of Christ so that you'll be a better person. He says, you will be conformed to the image of Christ. Why? So that Christ can be the firstborn of many brethren. What does that mean? That Christ can have greater preeminence. Do you get it? Until we're conformed to the image of Christ, Christ is not able fully to be the firstborn among, among many brethren. And it says that, uh, scripture tells us that Jesus is going to lead many sons unto glory. So our, our purpose, our, the, the will of God for our life, is that we be conformed to his image in every area of our character, of our nature, of our being. Right? Now, if we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, one of the things you never see Christ questioning God's will Except in the garden, if you want to call that questioning. He was just saying at that point, look, if there's any other way, let's do it another way, but I know, and never, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Right? So even in that, he was submitted to it. He was just saying, look, this is, this is not something I would choose, but I will obey. Right? Yeah. And it said that through that obedience, he was made perfect. Okay? And so, now, in watching how Jesus ministered, he even told us, he said, Pray this, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, many times we just repeat those words. Lord, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, while that is a model prayer, the rabbis in Jesus' day, uh, they would put together a prayer that pretty much summed up their doctrine. And that's how they taught their disciples to pray. And so you could take each part of a rabbi's uh, you know, flagship prayer, if you want to call it that. And you could take it apart, and then you would bring it to life in your life by living out their doctrine. So whenever Jesus said, pray this way, he said, when you pray, pray this, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you could pray those words. But that's so general, that's not a faith prayer. Instead, we are to know his will. So we are to pray God, your will is healing. God, your will, your will is that I be blessed. So I'm praying right now and I'm saying, I'm blessed. Amen. And I'm praying and I'm speaking 
And you can see in Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, these two are put together. One is about saying, and one is about speaking. How many of you know when you pray, you say? Right? You can't say, well, now I'm saying, but now I'm going to pray. Here I'm going to say, and I'm going to speak the end result, but when I pray, I'm going to beg and cry. Mm -hmm. See, those two don't go together. Right? right? So it's, God doesn't want you begging and crying. I mean, if, if your kids come to you, huh, they're just begging and crying. Um, I heard somebody say the other day, be a winner, not a whiner. <laughs> See, I, had, I had a sign here somewhere, I don't know where it went, but it said, um, I don't run a winery. W-H-I-N-E-R. Anyway. So, but you have to realize, God tends to run a, a winery because most people want to whine to him and they try to separate saying from praying. And your saying should match your praying. Or your praying should match your saying. Right? Now, that's if your praying and saying is good, that's good. But if your saying's bad, then change it. Amen? Say what God said. Now, let's read this. He goes on, he says, verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Now, just in case, if you are in Christ, if you are born again, this is you. Do you get that? This isn't about some people 2,000 years ago. This is you. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate. Who? He just told us ahead of time. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So now we have to decide, is that me? Because if I came into Christ, then I came into Christ and God foreknew that. And because he foreknew that I was going to do that, now he made it so that as soon as I did come into Christ in actuality, now I've been predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ. Right? So that means he's going to start working on me to change me. Now, then he said, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. So if you're in Christ, you're called. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm not called. You know, I just, and they mean called to ministry. I was talking um, <clears throat> with George uh, the other day, last night I think it was. And one of the things that um, we have to do as, as the body of Christ, we have to, fund, I mean, literally change Christianity, or I should say the, the idea of Christianity or the, the, the mindset of Christians. Because people look at certain things, for instance, people say, well, I can't start a life team, you know, I mean, because a life team, a person that runs a life team, they're, basically they're a pastor because they're, they're, they're overseeing uh, these people, this group of people that are meeting in their home or wherever they meet. And well, that's, that's not me, I, so I can't do that. No, you need to get your mind off of the title and get your mind onto what the Word of God says you're to do. You're to be a disciple who makes disciples, you see? And if you, ha if you make one disciple, it's funny, if, I, if I'm a discipler, Meaning, I'm a person who makes a disciple, and I'm making one disciple, I'm a discipler. But if I have five disciples, now I'm a pastor. See, there's something wrong with that picture. There are people who are called to pastor, to shepherd, to uh, function in that way. And as we said before, in life teams, many of the life team leaders are functioning as pastors. But what we have to realize is that life teams are a team. And so... Even a life team leader, if they're functioning as an overseer or a director or whatever you want to call it of a person's life, they are actually helping people grow. And it's not about being a pastor. You're not going to go have cards made and say you're pastoring. <clears throat> but you may know that as a life team leader, you're called to be a pastor. That may be your calling. But the bottom line here is when he says, whom he did for no, he did predestinate, and whom he predestinate, those that he also called, you have to realize you're calling is not your calling as an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Your calling is to be called into Christ to be conformed to the image of his son. That's your calling. You got that? <clears throat> now, for that calling to be fulfilled, you're going to have to do what the Bible says to do, or it'll never be fulfilled. You know, there are people that join the military and never become soldiers. Right? Now, they have a hard life because they're constantly fighting against the system, and usually they don't last their full Enlistment, usually they end up getting out after a short period of time or something. But if you're going into the military, you know, if you, go, if you join the Marines, guess what? You might have an idea of pretty uniforms, but that drill instructor has an idea of conforming you to the image of a Marine. And if your idea is pretty uniforms and his idea is, is a Marine, how many of you know uh, he's going to win? <laughs> right? And so... He's going to conform you to the image of a Marine. Same thing with any branch of service. So I don't know why we think it's different whenever we come into Christ, that we think we're going to come into Christ and just hide out 
in Christ until God, you know, zips us out of here or something. <clears throat> and he's going to come for us and we're going to be exactly the way he was when he, well, we were when, we, when he found us. His idea is not to leave you how he found you. His idea is to change you and to conform you to the image of Christ. Amen? Amen. That means <clears throat> you're going to have some experiences that may not always be pleasant. Right? Why? Because change isn't pleasant usually. And most people don't like change. Matter of fact, one of the ways that they can tell your level of mental health is by how well you adapt to change. That's one of the primary indicators of how mentally healthy you are. Right? <clears throat> now, he says here, and watch this. Uh, we'll start at verse 30 again. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. So see, if you're not called, you're not justified. So you're called if you're in Christ and you've accepted him and he is your Lord, then guess what? You're called. Okay? And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Well, that's good news, right? Verse 31. Now, what, now watch this. Paul is writing here to the Romans. And he says, what shall we then say to these things? What is our answer to what I just said? What I just wrote about of his foreordination, of his foreknowledge, of his predestinating us, uh, all these different things. What, what shall we say? How are we going to answer this? Here's what he said. You want the answer to that? It's simple. If God be for us, who can be against us? And that right there is enough. If you just learn that one verse and realize, or the, I should say these three verses here, that right there is enough to actually absolutely turn your life around. Because if you realize God is for you, who can be against you? Well, who is who? Is who? Well, that's anybody that could try to be against you. Now, you might have people that come against you, but nobody can successfully come against you, right? Unless you decide that they're coming against you somehow as the will of God, and therefore you settle for it, and basically you just allow it. So you have to decide, no, uh, this, you know, there's uh, lawsuits, things like this, uh, legal cases. No, no, uh, that, yeah, you can bring the charges against me, but, but you're going to lose, and you're going to waste a whole bunch of money. Why? Because who can be against me if God's for me, right? Now, it may look bad for a while, but that just gives God time to clear out all the people around you that don't trust him, right? Because you start, when things start looking bad, you'd be amazed how many people leave, how many people run off and how many people change their minds about you and start to say, well, you know, I thought he was a good guy. I thought it was this way, but you know, I mean, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. That's not always true, right? There can be smoke without fire, right? And the devil is real good at smoke screens. So we need to realize that if God is for you, who can be against you? And see, this is what I want to get to. When I start talking about questioning yourself, you have to realize, because when you start going through rough times or rough things, uh, most of the time people end up looking at things going, well, well is God really for me? I and mean, if he was, could, could these things be happening? Yeah, they could be happening. God didn't say they wouldn't happen. He said, guess what? Storms are going to come. The, the wind's going to blow. The rain's going to fall. Things are going to happen. You're going to go through storms just like the bad people. The difference is your house will stand. In other words, you are coming out of this, Right? It's not going to last forever. Job, everybody talks about Job, and Job's entire bad times lasted approximately nine months. Now think about that. Nine months. It, well, it didn't last years. Everybody act like it lasted, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. It didn't last that way. It lasted about nine months. And then that whole time, God said, uh, Job never said anything wrong about me. Think about that. Amen. So, now Job's comforters, <clears throat> they said all kinds of things. <clears throat> they said all kinds, and God even showed up and talked to them. He said, the things you've said about me is wrong. You've spoken wrong about me. Imagine that. You can imagine their knees were knocking, right? They're probably pretty worried about that. When God shows up and says, you've been talking about me and you've been saying wrong things, that's not somebody you want showing up on your doorstep, right? right? When you've been gossiping bad about them. So, or, let's just take it further. Or, you don't want the person that you've been gossiping about that is right with God you don't want them showing up on your doorstep saying, you've been gossiping about me, and I just want you to know, God is for me. And if you're not for me, then that means you're against God. Yeah. Think about that. Amen? See, people don't like this kind of talk, but the fact is, this is all through the Bible. And you can see people, and you can see all the people that were right with God were always able to stand up and go, you know what? Here's what it'll be. 
Paul, think about Paul. Paul was chained between two guards at the point that he writes this at one point. They even talk about how uh, in Roman, uh, during, the, during those times, according to Roman military custom, the way they did things, and believe me, the Roman military was uh, very specific about how they did things, and it said that at the time that Paul wrote his letter, the, the letter I'm going to refer to here, it said that he would have been literally chained on both hands to a Roman guard. So every time he moved his arms, the guard knew it. Think about that. And he was writing uh, this letter, and he said, you know, um, I would rather be gone. I would rather be out of here. I'd rather be with Christ because to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. I'd rather be there. But the church needs me here. And, and you know, and I'm really in a fix between the two, uh, whether to stay or go. As if he's calling the shots. Here's a prisoner chained between two Roman guards. And he said, I had made up my mind yet whether I'll stay or go. And then later on he goes, but you know, the church needs me. So I'll stay a while. <coughs> so he made the decision. And you know those Roman guards, they probably saw what he was writing. They probably heard, and he's like, who is this, who is this guy writing this that he actually thinks he's calling the shots, right? And then later he writes down and says, okay, I finished my course, I've run my race, I'm done, I poured myself out, and I'm ready to go. And then he was executed. Now, I do not know for, you know, for fact, but it would not surprise, because usually when they gave them guards like that, a lot of times they were with them for the entire period of time. <clears throat> whether they were or whether or not, it doesn't matter. But I almost would think that whenever the Romans that were chained to Paul saw him get released, that had to affect them. And then later when they heard that he was crucified, or not crucified, but beheaded, according to tradition anyway, when he was beheaded, they probably thought, wow, I guess, I guess he finally figured it was his time to go. I can not only help but think they might have got saved by seeing how Paul lived his life in front of them. Think about that. Because none of that stuff is wasted. God uses that kind of stuff. He used Stephen to get Saul, Paul, saved. God doesn't waste anything. Amen? Amen? The problems you're going through, the things that you think that nobody else knows about or nobody else sees, or maybe they see your problem, but they don't know the details. Let me tell you, God uses those things. And he'll remind people. Remember how so-and-so was when they were going through there? Remember how they were diagnosed terminal? And they, 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 you found out about it, but they didn't talk about it. They didn't sit around talking about it all day. And they didn't, remember how they didn't get depressed? And you thought, wow, they were diagnosed terminal? I'd have never known. And then they find out, oh, well, they got completely healed. Don't think God won't use that kind of stuff. He'll bring that to your remembrance and to the people's remembrance. So how we live our life, the Bible says we are to be open epistles open, read of every man. So our life is an epistle. It's a book that's being read by people around us. And so we need to live lives that can be examples of people, of faith, of purity, of charity. All these things that Paul told Timothy. He said, you knew me. You, 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 you know me, I should say. He said, you know what I've taught. You know how I live. You've seen what I've taught to the public. we have been around me. You know my manner of life. Think about that. And so that's the kind of lives we're supposed to be living. Amen? Amen? So now, look at this. He says, who shall lay anything? Well, I should go back. He that spared, now get this. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, with him, also freely give us all things? He said, listen, if God gave his best for you, He's not going to hold anything back from you. As a matter of fact, whenever he gave Jesus, he gave us everything that he had with Jesus. So when we receive Jesus, we get everything given to us at that moment in our life. And really what we do is spend the rest of our life learning what is ours and our faith in God. That We look at him and go, that's true. That's true for me. It's mine. Then you step into your inheritance. That's what you do the rest of your life. It's given to you at the moment you're born again. But you spend the rest of your life finding out what's yours. And so, well, now, you do that. Now, hopefully, have you found 1 Samuel? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. 1 Samuel chapter 3, all right? We're going to start in verse 16. It says, Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord has said unto you? I pray thee, hide it not from me. 
And if you remember the story, uh, God had just given Samuel a vision about Eli and his house and about the wickedness that was going on in this house. And Eli wouldn't take care of it. He wouldn't deal with it. And so God told Samuel, I'm fixing to end Eli's time as a prophet. And I'm fixing to, to, to judge this situation because Eli won't judge it himself. I mean, that's what Paul said. If I judge myself, I won't be judged. Amen? Amen. So he said, <clears throat> what is the thing the Lord has said unto you? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee. And more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. And now that's, that'll get you to open your mouth. right? <laughs> if you don't tell me, everything he said is going to come on you. Because you got to remember, Eli was still a prophet. He could still proclaim these things, right? And Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems him good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord, now listen to this, Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Think about that. Now, the Bible says that all of these lives of the prophets are given to us as, as an example for us to learn from. So we can learn from Eli's life. Guess what? If there's a situation going on, you got to judge it. you got to judge yourself. you got to judge your house, so to speak. And you got to get your house in order or it will be judged. Right? Then he ought, but now notice what it said about Samuel. What do we learn from Samuel's life? Well, we learn from Samuel's life that God can keep any word you speak from falling to the ground. In other words, what he's saying is God, can, God made all of Samuel's words come to pass. That's what that means. And God can make all of your words come to pass. Do you get that? Why? Because you are the prophet of your own life. So the Bible says, throughout the Old Testament, even in the New, uh, it's, the Spirit came only upon three kinds of people. And that was the prophet, the priest, and the king. That's the only three kinds of people that the Spirit of God ever came upon. Now, the fact is, you now in Christ, having the Spirit of Christ, Guess what? We are made kings and priests under our God, right? Well, guess what? To be a priest or to be a prophet, you had to be a priest. So here we can see that we are to be prophets because we are, remember, the only three people that the Spirit came upon, the, the, the prophet, the king, and the priest. Well, we, I just showed you out of Revelation, there's two places, actually it says that we are made kings and priests, and I'm telling you that you are made a prophet also to your own life, that you can prophesy the will of God for your own life based on the prophecies that God has already said before. Paul told Timothy, war a good warfare. We talked about this last week. War a good warfare with the prophecies that have gone on before you, right? And he said, hands have been laid on you, words have been said, and he said, war a good warfare. Now, look at um, verse, yeah, remember this. And, and God, the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground, right? Say this with me. Father, Father I, thank you now I thank you now that you will let none of my words, of my words fall, to ground, fall to the ground in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Now, you know what that means. That means you got to make sure what you say you want to come to pass. Amen. Amen? That means you don't talk sickness and disease and death and problems and lack and that you start speaking what you want to come to pass. You speak the end result. Faith always speaks the end result. Faith does not speak what it sees. You get it? What the eyes can see, put it that way. <clears throat> Anybody can do that. It doesn't take faith to tell the problem or look at the problem, see the problem, and talk about the problem. Everybody does that. It takes faith to look past the problem at the answer and speak the answer until the answer is now physically in front of you. That's what faith does, all right? Now, that's why so few people actually walk in faith. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 53, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, notice his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. Now, notice it was his own country, but it was their synagogue. You get that? It would have been his synagogue, too, because it was his own country. But it doesn't say that. It says in their synagogue. Now watch. Insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Now, this is why it was their synagogue and not his synagogue. Why? Because their synagogue was full of doubt and unbelief. Do you get that? His synagogue, his church, is not full of doubt and unbelief. Do you get that? All right. 
<clears throat> is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man, notice here's their problem, they only saw him as a man. Not, a, not even as a prophet. Because even the prophets they knew had power. So they only saw him as a man. They couldn't get past the familiarity. He grew up here. We know his mama. We know his daddy. We know his brothers and sisters. We know, uh, see, they couldn't get past the humanity of him. They knew him well enough, or, and, and enough, which also stands out to show that he didn't always, when he was growing up there, he didn't walk around acting like the Son of God all the time. Amen? Amen. So, it says, <clears throat> And whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Now notice, offended. A minute ago it said they were astonished. Now it says they were offended. Astonishment can quickly turn to offense. Okay? But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Now look at verse 58. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Right? Now people have used that to say, See, even Jesus couldn't get people healed in his own hometown. And that we'll talk about that in just a minute. But I want you to look at this. He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, here's the question. Now, and remember, nothing I preach is ever meant for condemnation, so don't get in condemnation and that kind of stuff. I'm just, I want you to hear this because the point is for you to grow, right? See, you, you can, I, I don't mind you coming under conviction because I preach the Word of God. And when you hear the Word of God and you hear where, here's what the Word of God says, and here's where you're walking. See, when you just say, well, I should be walking there, and you decide to move up to there, that's conviction. But when you hear that and go, wow, that's where that is, and this is where I am, I'll never be there, I can never do that, I, you know, it's not even worth trying. Now you're entering into condemnation because you are deciding not to be who God called you to be. Do you get that? So I don't preach condemnation, I preach the word. You decide if it becomes conviction or condemnation. That's on you, you got that? Okay, now, <clears throat> but here's the question. In verse 58, it says, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, here's the question I want to ask you. How many mighty works can God do in your life? All of them. Yeah, if, as long as you don't have unbelief. Because whatever, whatever he is not doing, listen, listen carefully. Whatever you need, God has provided. Do you agree with that? He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Is that right? And it says that he hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Is that right? Yes. So everything we need, he has given. So anything we need that we're not seeing in our life, we're not seeing it because of unbelief. Boy, you're that quiet. <laughs> now, again, no condemnation. Conviction. Change. Make a decision. All right. Now, what I mean by that, I'm not talking, I understand whatever's not a faith is sin. I get that, but I'm not emphasizing, uh, you know, the, the sin part of it. I'm saying change. You can, you can change. You can make a decision and go and say, okay, uh, oh, I see that. Now, <clears throat> so if you're not seeing something in your life, it's because of unbelief. So the key is to find out what is causing my unbelief. What am I unbelieving? What does the Bible say that I have that I am not believing? Now, here's the, here's the, the key to this. You can tell what you believe two main ways. Well, I would even say three, but let's say, well, well, I'll give you all three, but we're going to emphasize two, okay? <clears throat> the three main ways that you can tell uh, what you're believing, where you're at, is by what you think. That's the third way, actually, and that's the, le the not the least way, but it's not the main thing I'm talking about. But the other two things are what you say and what you do, how you act, what do you do on a daily basis. What do you say on a daily basis? Because what you say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you're saying is essentially what you're thinking, right? So the key is make sure you're thinking right, speaking right, and acting right, doing right. Now, when I say thinking, speaking, and acting or doing, I'm not talking about doing everything just right. I'm talking about thinking correctly. I'm talking about acting correctly according to the Word of God, according to what you believe. You got that? See, when you believe you're healed, you act healed. Right? right? You, don't, you don't say, you don't believe you're healed and, <clears throat> and act sick. Right? 
uh, you know, it, it's, uh, <coughs> for, I'll give you one example. Um, <coughs> well, I, can give you, I could actually give you a couple. But if I understand that if you have a disability, that it makes life hard. I, I totally get that, okay? Now, if, if it were me, I don't care whatever happened to me, I would never have that blue thing hanging in my car. Why? Because that means now I've accepted that, and that means I identify with that, and I'm making my life easier because of it. Now, see? Why? Because I was raised in, under a man of God <clears throat> that showed me how to walk in faith and so I made certain decisions based on that, that I would never coddle sickness or disease in me. I would never baby it, right? Now, that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, I, mean, I understand if you, you do what you got to do, I get that. But you should never accept a diagnosis or a symptom or anything else as part of who you are. Because that's not who you are, Amen. right? See, if I have a flat tire coming in to, to, to the office sometime, uh, that, flat, that flat tire does not define me. I, I get out, I fix it, and I move on, right? And it's the same thing with sickness or disease. And you might be in the process of fixing your flat tire, but don't ever think that you're a flat tire. Amen? Amen? Amen. Maybe some of us that need flatter tires, but anyway, that's a whole other thing. It's a whole other sermon. <laughs> so, all right, now, all right, <clears throat> let's go to Mark chapter 6. So what was the question? What can God do through you? Because whatever he can't do through you is because of unbelief. So the answer is to find out what is causing your unbelief. What are you not believing that God has said? And what you're not believing, now listen carefully, like I said, those three, those, uh, what you're not believing is going to be based on what you're thinking, what you're saying, and how you act. You can, and according to even John Lake, and I've proven this now in my own life, <clears throat> that it, as he said, it is the law of the human mind that I can act myself into believing faster than I can believe myself into acting. Most people say, well, I'm not going to act well until I feel well. Mm. Well, then, then let the thing run its natural course because that's what you're doing. Because the natural course is maybe you should get well over a period of time unless it's a terminal illness. And then the natural course is you're going to die of it. Right? Let's just be honest. I, I don't like all the you know, hide the truth stuff that I see in a lot of churches, a lot of sermons and things. But if you, if you if, now listen carefully, what I'm talking about is the natural course. But you don't have to live according to the natural course. You can live according to the supernatural course where you bring God's word and his power into, to, to bear onto that situation. And now it changes and it doesn't have to run its natural course. That's what healing is, mm -hmm. is that something does not have to run its natural course. Right? right? You hear that? <clears throat> now, so <clears throat> if you're going, if, if you, you can act yourself into believing. So all you have to do is find out what the Bible says about you and start acting that way, and it will change your thought process. It will eventually change your mouth, and the longer it takes to change your mouth, the longer it takes for you to see the supernatural take over your situation. So the real key is change your mouth, okay, which you mainly do by changing your thinking, because according to the, what the Bible says, uh, you know, the, the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So change your thinking, change your speaking, change your actions. If you do that, you will absolutely, you cannot, you cannot change those three things without changing your life. You cannot do it. It is impossible. And the Word of God says if you do these things, you will change your life. Now, Mark chapter 6, verse 1. He, and this is the same situation of Matthew 13. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, <clears throat> and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things, and what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Now stop right there. Notice <clears throat> that they understood that mighty works were wrought because of wisdom given to him. You get that? They said the reason he can do these mighty works is because he has wisdom. Now think about that. What wisdom? That God would work through him. That's one of the, the wisdoms that Jesus had. Well, the Bible also says that Jesus is made unto us wisdom. So guess what we've got? We've got the wisdom of God. 
If we have the wisdom of God, then we ought to be able to do the same mighty works that Jesus did. Well, it sounds like a scripture, doesn't it? Amen. But if we believe on him, which is what? The wisdom of God. It's wise. If you believe on Jesus, you are operating in the wisdom of God because God knows it is the wisest thing you can do is believe on Jesus. Amen? Amen. So you believe on him, and because of that, you have the wisdom of God. Because you have the wisdom of God, you can do these mighty works. You got that? Amen. See, too many people sit around waiting for God to zap them, dump something on them, cause something to happen, and, he, and even... Uh, Solomon said in Proverbs, he said, wisdom, get wisdom, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom. Why? Because when you have wisdom, you know how things work. When you know how things work, you can do things. Mm -hmm. Do you know why I see the results in healing that I see? It's because I know how it works. Why? Because I have the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. I searched for it. I dug it out. It wasn't being spread around whenever I started. And, and you know, last week, I guess it was, or last Saturday, I think it was, uh, was the anniversary, or actually, I should just, it's not an anniversary, it's actually my daughter's birthday, our first daughter that passed away when she was two. <clears throat> and even before she passed away, I started searching. I went after it, and I didn't care what I found. I didn't care who had the truth. All I wanted was truth. And I found it in the Bible, and I found out that it wasn't out a whole lot. And so we started doing it. Now, now get this. I read it. I started thinking it. I sat around. I thought about it putting two and two together with the help of the Holy Spirit. Didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. Many times helped me, but it was. And so then I would figure certain things out with the help of the Holy Spirit. Then, <clears throat> so what I started doing, first I'm reading, then I'm thinking, then I start to say it. I start telling people, and guess what happens when you start telling people something they never heard before? They think you're crazy. <laughs> and they argue with you, right? Well, well how, how can you know that? I mean, I ain't never heard that before, and if that was true, surely somebody else would have said it. Well, I'm sure somebody else did say it, and everybody said they were crazy, so they quit saying it, right? The difference maybe was I was just so uh, tenacious about it, I wouldn't quit. I didn't care what anybody else thought. And so we just kept on saying it. And I got a whole bunch of new friends. Why? That means I, got, I lost a whole bunch of old ones, all right? Amen. And, I, and I, I was good with that. Why? Because I would rather hang out with people that believe the Word of God than people that just want to fit in with a group. And so we started, I started reading it, started thinking it, started saying it, and then I started doing it. You know, uh, one of the blessings I had this last week uh, <clears throat> was serendipitous, actually. I was taking my, uh, my wife and I were taking my sister-in-law's car up to a, a shop, and it was a long ways out. Uh, it was like an hour drive each way, right, because she knew these people. So we go up there, and when we passed back by, we, we were passing by a place where the first person that ever put together our website was. And they, they put together the website, they were friends of ours, and I hadn't seen them in like 18 years, or I don't know, something like that. It's probably at least 15 years anyway. And so my wife said, are you, are you gonna stop by? And I said, yeah, so we pulled in, I went up and knocked on the door, and here's a person I haven't seen in 15 years or so. And it was a family reunion, I mean, we hugged, and just, it was so good to see each other. and. And one of the first things he said, he said, man, you know, because uh, we were talking about <coughs> physical situations. And he said, man, you know, I, I, I'm doing it. He said, I remember the, some of the first things you taught me. He, he was, you might hear me tell the story, <coughs> how he was going to a, uh, a particular denominational church. And he came and he heard I was talking about healing. And so he invited me to go to the hospital with him. And so we went to the hospital. And while we were there praying for a guy that was in a coma, the pastor came up behind us and heard us and kind of got upset. Uh, that I was there because I wouldn't remember that church and he thought I was a particular type of camp, I guess, and he didn't like that camp. And so he thought I was doing things and saying things that I wouldn't say and he thought I was putting the blame on other people and that kind of stuff. And while we're standing there talking to him, uh, the guy comes out of the coma, right? That's always good. It's always good when it happens like that, you know. So, but this is a guy, and he said, but I remember one of the first things, uh, one of the things you taught me a long time ago was, and so I went to Walmart. I just started going around praying for people. Why? He was sowing for his healing, right? And he was going out and praying for people. And so, and it reminded me, I'm like, yeah, because I remember in those early days how we started, and it was just so few people that would actually go with us anywhere. And so we got, I got to see him again. It was a real blessing to see him, uh, you know, not to mention I found out he's also a gunsmith, so that made things good too. So we just, <laughs> we just really reconnected on, on every level. It was really good. So, but... Um, 
it was really, uh, it, it's good when you see people and you go back and you remember how you started. Amen? And so uh, in that time, I was going to, I'd go to Walmart and just walk around and just find people that were sick and just, just minister to them. And so, and that's how we got started. And most of the time I had to go alone because most people wouldn't go with me, right? But we kept going, kept going, kept going until finally, now, believe it or not, this, the, the, what we teach on healing is the number one teaching on healing in the world right now. The number one of people that are actually doing it. Amen? And all, the, all that has changed in 20 years. Literally. We've, and that's what Sid Roth said. He said, uh, you're going to change the face of Christianity as we know it. And honestly, it's happened. Why? Because it's truth. People want truth. They want to walk in truth. They don't want to just be told, you know, in the sweet by and by, there's going to be healing. They want to walk in truth. They want to walk. They want to do things for God. And they want to know they can do it. Now, this takes you right back to what I'm talking about. Because here's, here's the point. Remember what I said about Samuel? It said that God didn't let any of his words fall to the ground. So, and remember, we also talked about how people doubt themselves and they doubt God. Listen, the whole reason I'm speaking this this morning is because what God told me to tell the people that are listening, whether present or internet or any other way, is this. Trust God to back you up. You have to decide. So many people are wondering and they think they're on their own. Man, if I thought I was on my own in this, there's no way I could have kept going 20 years, 25 years now like this. So you have to decide, is God with you? I is he with you? If he's with you, then nothing can successfully stand against you. That's why I read Romans a while ago. Amen. You have to decide, because he talks about famine and peril and tribulation, all that stuff. And he said, and who can be against us if God be for us? Well, that's my question to you. Is God for you? No, I don't, don't just give it lip service. Oh yeah, God is for me. I'm blessed, you know, blessed and highly favored. No, come on, let's get past the cliches because the cliches don't get you healed. The cliches don't get you, don't, don't cause you to walk in the blessing of God. The, cl the cliches don't get other people healed through you and you walking in the power of God. Let's get to reality and let's decide, is God for us or not? Now, let's go beyond us because I know God's for me. My life proves it. I'm telling you, my life proves it, right? And times when I wouldn't have been for me, God was for me. So really the question comes down, is God for you? Because I know he's for me. But, and for you to walk in the things that God wants you to walk in, you've got to know he's for you. And what that means is, now I'm not talking about you walking perfect. Because remember, perfect is not walking without mistakes. Perfect is when you make a mistake, you get right back right with God immediately and keep walking. That's perfect. See, that's not our kind of perfect. Because if it was our kind of perfect, see, our kind of perfect says don't make a mistake. If you ever make a mistake, you can never be perfect. But thank God, that's not God's kind of perfect, because if that were true, then God couldn't even use us. Why? Because we'd have to be perfect for him to use us in, this, in, in our minds, and we never attain that. But we can, according to the Word of God, we are perfect and can attain perfection and maintain perfection in God if we obey him. The Bible says a righteous man falls down seven times and gets up eight. Think about that. A righteous man falls down seven times. Now, see, we would say, if I were to ask you, how many times does a righteous man fall? Or does a righteous man ever fall? Oh, no, no. A righteous man would never fall. Then no one's righteous. Why? Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? Amen? Come on, are you with me on this? You realize all I'm saying is Scripture, right? I'm just quoting Scripture to you. That's all I'm doing. <clears throat> so it's not the falling down that God focuses on. It's the getting back up. Now, if you fall down and stay down, then according to the Bible, you're not a righteous person. But if you fall down and get up, you're righteous. Amen? Amen. Again, that's good news. Okay? Now, <clears throat> notice here, it, they, he says, Whence hath this man this wisdom, these mighty works? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm back in Matthew 13. <clears throat> in uh, Mark, let's go down to verse 4. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, except that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Now, number one, he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them, which means every person he laid hands on got healed. So Jesus did not try and fail to heal anyone. Everybody he ministered to got healed. Now, notice, I was driving, and the scripture just, it was like it was right in front of me. 
Think about this. He's, here he is in the middle of his own area, people that knew him, and they were all in unbelief. And in the middle of that unbelief, Jesus could there do no mighty work except he could heal. Do you get that? The one thing he could do is he could heal. And yet if you listen to most preachers talking about healing, if the person's in unbelief, oh, forget it, it won't work. And yet be a, a, an entire city being in unbelief did not stop Jesus from healing. Now, it did stop him maybe from doing other things because it said he did not many mighty works. He could there do no mighty works except. So there was stuff he couldn't do there. Now, think about that. And this hit me so hard today, when, or not today, but the other day when I was driving. Imagine standing before Jesus and you're saying, why, why did you remember, remember that time uh, I was going through this? Remember that time my friend was going through this and I prayed and nothing happened? What, what? And Jesus said, yeah. I couldn't because you were in unbelief. I, I could, I wanted to help, but I could not. And I thought, wow, imagine standing before him and him telling you he couldn't help you because of your unbelief. Now, I'm not talking about healing because even in the middle of healing, people, I mean, in the middle of unbelief, people got healed, right? right. I'm talking about in your life. So all, what I'm asking is this, <clears throat> what is it that we're not letting God do? What could you do? What, what, what could God do through you? if you could just believe him. Amen? Because believing him is not hard. Right. Believe, but, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when it says hearing by the word of God, it literally means hearing and obeying, hearing and doing. And whenever you hear the word and do the word, faith is present to cause what you're doing to come to pass. Right? <clears throat> you know, somebody could send you a check in the mail or they could say, here, your check is at my office. Come pick it up. Well, it's always good to get a check in the mail, but if they say the check is at the office, you, can't, there, you have no right to sit around and complain about you not having your check or, or money whenever they said the check is it's at my office. Just, just come pick it up. No, it's because you didn't act on it to go pick it up. So it's not the person's fault. Isn't that right? <laughs> it's not the person's fault. It, 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 is, it is your fault if you don't go pick it up. And here he is saying, now, if you have faith, I can do these things. So it's on us to have faith in him, which means that whatever it takes for us to get there, we got to be able to do it. If that means cutting things out, because listen, <clears throat> one of the, the main things, um, <clears throat> a person came to me the other day and they said, man, you know, I've been wanting to, 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 to meet with you and I, you know, I just got a couple of questions I want to ask you. I'm like, great, okay, well, you know, what, what can I help you with? And, and then they just start talking. And they talked and talked and talked, and they never asked the question. They just talked. Now, listen, I don't, I don't think more highly of myself than I ought. I don't think of myself as higher than any other person or anything else. I think we're all brothers and sisters, you know, and I know your time's valuable. My time's valuable, right? <clears throat> if I, and I remember, man, I remember going to camp meetings and conventions, and I see these speakers, and, man, they just give a, an amazing word from God and it's, it's impactful and it's right there in the scripture and you're like, wow. And then you watch them walk off and you think, man, if I, if I could just spend five minutes with that guy or that girl, whoever it was, if I could just spend five minutes with them, I know I could ask them two or three questions that would absolutely change the trajectory of my life, right? Now, maybe you've never felt that way about a preacher. Maybe for you, it was some, you know, self-help guru or somebody, you know, somebody around, oh, you know, if I could just spend five minutes with Tony Robbins, my life would change. If I could spend five minutes with somebody, my life would change. Okay, whoever it is. But you realize that for your life to change, if you meet somebody and you're going to talk to them and your life is going to change, for that life to change, you have to stop talking. Amen. Do you get that? You have to stop talking. Listen, now, un unless, of course, you're asking a question. Now, it's, it's wise to ask questions if you know someone that has what you want. When I was with Dr. Summerall, man, I had questions. Why? Because he had something I wanted. And I had the questions, and I'd ask him questions. But guess what? As soon as I ask a question, I shut up. Why? Because I was waiting for the answer. See, if, as, long as, as long as I kept talking, he wouldn't answer. So I would never get my answer. But if I could say the question and shut up, the sooner I could shut up, the sooner I got my answer. Because yep. you don't learn anything by talking. Amen?
and so <clears throat> I started realizing that the real, and so many people come to me and they want to, they, they, they you know, if, oh, I have a couple of questions. And they really don't have any questions. They just want to tell me about their life or they want to tell me something, which in, you know, many cases it's interesting or something, but at the same time, many cases not. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, it, but the bottom line is we have to get to a place where if we're going for something, we ask for it, ask the question, whatever it is, and then stop talking. Mm -hmm. Amen? But, in, and if that person stands there and looks at you, guess what? Most of the time you'll start talking again because we're trained not to have silence. Mm -hmm. But it's in the silence that the wisdom of God comes out. If you ask me a question and I'm quiet for a minute, it's not because I'm, I'm not going to answer you. It's because I'm not going to answer you out of just maybe my own understanding. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm waiting to get the right answer for you because the answer I could just give off the top of my head might be biblical, but it might not be exactly the answer you need. I need the wisdom of God to come out. And many times you have to be quiet first for that wisdom to bubble up through all of your thinking so it'll come out instead of what you think. Now I'm talking about people whose minds are not renewed to the Word of God completely, right? Because you can renew your mind to the Word of God to the point where you have the mind of Christ so that you can open your mouth and the wisdom of God will come out automatically. That's where we're all headed. That's when we are conformed to the image of Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. <clears throat> now, I don't know. You know, usually we have these messages uh, on CD or whatever in the bookstore right afterwards. I would highly suggest, if we do, for you to get this one today because there is a lot of Scripture, a lot of things coming out that you could take pieces and analyze it and talk to God about it and let him show you some things on it. Things that are not in my notes, things that are coming out uh, that I, I can guarantee I'm going to get it. I'm going to get a copy of this and <laughs> go back through it. <laughs> Add to my notes. So, now, <clears throat> it said he laid his hands on a few sick folk and he healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. You know, twice it says that he marveled at, at somebody's faith. But, and especially with the Roman centurion and then with the uh, Syrophoenician woman, but here he said he marveled at their unbelief in, this, in his own hometown. Now, it's, it's a simple question, simple answer. What do you want Jesus to marvel at? Your faith or your unbelief? Yeah. I want him to marvel at my faith. Yeah. Amen? But that means I have to actually find out what I have to have faith in and how to have faith in him for that. Now, let's go to the last part here. Here's some notes. Number one, Jesus healed even in the presence of unbelief. Number two, Jesus healed everyone he laid hands on. Now, laying on of hands provides the greatest direct transfer of power. Okay? It is also the lowest form of ministry. Think about that, right? <clears throat> if you want, um, you can have wireless internet or you can have fiber optics. Right? And to be wired in is better than wireless. Right? Why? Because it's a direct transfer right there. It's faster. It's stronger. Right? Than wireless. Now, but, now think about this. So it has the greatest direct transfer of power. Laying on of hands is the, is the method that has the greatest direct transfer of power. But it is the lowest form of ministry because to do it, you have to be present with the person that needs it which severely limits, because even right now, here we are in the same room, and yet I'm not touching anybody, right? So it, we're even limited, even though we're in the same room, laying on of hands is limited to the proximity of the person transmitting the power of God. Does this make sense to you? Mm -hmm. And so, so it's the lowest form because of the requirements. But now, the highest form is for me to simply believe. And the minute, and if, if you're on my mind, when I believe, you get healed. That's the, that's the biblical way it works. And that's the greatest form. Not even praying. Not even speaking, right? Which praying and speaking and all these things, they all work, but they're all differing levels. But the greatest is to simply believe and then expect the results. That's the greatest form of faith, right? And because it can be done anywhere for anybody, anywhere, regardless of their proximity to where you are. Right? Even, even praying uh, over the phone to someone in Australia or someone in Europe, that's an amazing miracle to be able to do that. But at the same time, there's still that connection. Right? So it's even greater to hear the need and be able to believe, and then that person says, well, you must have prayed because 
I got healed at this time. It's exactly what happened with John Lake's wife with Dowie. That they said, would you pray for her? She had gotten shot. And they said, would you pray for her? And he said, they said, yeah. And they knew that every morning at 9.30, they, he prayed for all the prayer requests that came in. So at 9.30, she looked up at the clock and said, well, it's 9.30. Dowie must have praised, must have prayed, so I must be healed. And she got up out of bed and was instantly healed. Think about it. So, okay. anyway, <clears throat> whole other thing. So, number three. In the case of the woman with the issue of blood, she was the only one healed. Y'all remember this? Even though many were touching him. Now, think about that. Everybody was touching. She's the only one that got something. Mm -hmm. Right? Why? Only later did others get healed when they touched him because of her testimony. What did Jesus turn when he found, he turned around and found out who it was? She told him all the truth and he said, daughter, your faith. Get that? Your faith made you whole. See, her faith, his power. What went out of him? Virtue, power. So when faith and power come together, there's a miracle. You got it? Now, here's the beauty of our situation. We are now in Christ after the resurrection, so now Christ lives in us. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Is that right? Yes. So the power that was in Christ is now in us, and according to the power that works in you, God can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can think or ask. So now Christ is living in us, the power is living in us, and we have faith. So there's never a reason to say, well, I have faith, I gotta go find somebody with power. Mm -hmm. No, I have faith and I have power, and I can cause a divine chemical reaction of whatever I need to take place anywhere I need it. Yes, Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen, all right, now, okay. <clears throat> Number four, Jesus, and you and I that believe on him, can heal the sick, right? But there are greater miracles that we can't do unless the person actually has faith. The new birth. The new birth is a greater miracle than healing. Amen? It's the greatest miracle there can be. And we can't do that without the person that needs to get born again, without them having faith in Christ. See, I can get you healed because I can give you the power to get you healed to change the body. But I can't get you saved unless you decide to cooperate. Do you get that? See, this is where certain camps have made mistakes in times past between healing uh, because they thought that the person had to have faith for healing too. So, now, <clears throat> number, uh, yeah, such as getting them born again, and there's two things here. Now, we can change their life, right? We can bless them. We can, we can change, uh, we can change their, their, their circumstances right then, but we cannot guarantee continued change unless the person now decides to agree, right? Now, Mark 11, we know this one already, verse 12, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. So apparently, Jesus was a great prophet, but not a good farmer. Because he didn't know what season it was. He didn't know it wasn't time for figs, okay? Now, and Jesus, now watch this. And Jesus answered and said unto him, and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, notice first off. What did he do? He did not pray. He made a decree. He gave a command. Notice what it was. He passed judgment on that tree. And the sentence was that the tree could never again fulfill its divine ordained purpose. He said, no man eat fruit of you hereafter forever. Why? That's, the, that's the, the tree's only purpose, is to produce fruit for man to eat. That's the only purpose for a tree to be here. You get it? And so when it did not do it, when it was expected, Jesus, now notice he gave a decree. He just said, no man eat fruit of you hereafter forever. Now watch this. <clears throat> and his disciples heard it. So he made a decree. And, he, and the thing to remember is this. He said it loud enough for all of his disciples to hear it. He didn't whisper it. What does that mean? That means he was sure. You hear that? He wouldn't, he would, well, I'm going to go try this. I'm going to whisper it in case it doesn't work. That way I don't look stupid. <laughs> right? No, he said it loud enough. He just said it. Right? Now, after this, Jesus went on into Jerusalem. Now watch it in verse 19. It says, And when evening was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. 
notice it w didn't start dying in the leaves and go down. It, life was cut off at the root and everything else died. When we speak to sickness or disease, we speak to it, not the symptoms, but the actual disease itself. And because of that, we cut off its life and then the symptoms start to die. Okay? Now, and Peter, <clears throat> calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Now notice, <clears throat> Jesus gave a decree, Peter called it a curse. Why? Because it was negative speaking, but notice what it said. It said it could not fulfill its divine purpose. Anytime you speak to a person and say, you're stupid, you're an idiot, uh, you're, you know, you'll never learn this, uh, you'll never amount to anything. What are you doing? You are cursing them. Why? Because you're saying you will never accomplish your divine purpose because God's divine purpose for every human is not that they be stupid, not that they be ignorant, not that they never amount to anything. God has plans for each and every person on this earth. Amen? Amen. And his plans are good. Right? I know it better still be behind me. All right? His plans are good. Right? Now, <clears throat> now watch this. Verse 22. Now, you get this. He, he spoke to the fig tree. It died. They bring it to his attention. What is Jesus' next words? He didn't go, yeah, ain't that something? Well, <laughs> you, now you know who you're dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I speak to things and they die. Don't make me mad. Okay. So, no. no, Jesus didn't say that. He did not say that. All right. Now watch. Watch what he does. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Guys, why are you surprised? Have faith in God. All things are possible. You can do this, right? That's why whenever, you remember Jesus in the boat? Storms come up. Peter comes back, says, Jesus, don't you, Master, don't you, don't you care that we die? We're going to drown here. And Jesus got up, spoke to the wind and sea, and says, where's your faith? Isn't that right? He said, peace be still. And then he told his own disciples, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Did I tell you to go to the middle of the lake and drown? No, I told you to go to the other side. Peter, you should have got up, walked to the edge of the boat and said, listen, Wind, waves, I got the son of the living God right here in this boat. We ain't drowning. You're going to stop because we're going to the other side. So Amen. peace be still. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus would have got up the next morning. Wow, oh, that was a good sleep, good nap. Floating along there. <laughs> I heard a little commotion last night. Peter, I, I heard you. Good job. Good job. Why? Because he would have been in faith Amen. instead of getting rebuked. We want to be in faith. Amen. Amen? We want to hear what? Well done not depart from me. Amen? Amen? All right. He says here, have faith in God. Now, here's the question. Did Jesus have faith in God when he cursed the fig tree? Wait for you answer. Okay. Let's say yes, okay? But what did Jesus have faith in God for? Was it that the fig tree would die or that God would uphold whatever Jesus said? Now think about that. Did, did he say, no man, because he didn't say, fig tree, die. Right. There are fig trees that don't produce figs. Mm -hmm. And they still live. They're useless, but they live. Right? So Jesus didn't say die. Jesus had faith in God that God would uphold his words, not that the fig tree would die. Do, do you get, okay, do you see where I'm going with that? Yes, Jesus trusted God to back him up, whatever he said. See, we think God is waiting for us to say something, and he's going to say, yeah, I can agree with that, or yes, I agree with that. Uh, yet, oh, that's not my plan. That's not my will. So no, I'm not going to uphold that word. No, no, no. You got to realize, learn the word of God, think the word of God, speak the word of God. You never have to worry about God backing you up. As long as you're speaking God's word, he will always uphold his word. When he upholds his word, and it's coming out of your mouth, he's upholding your words. Do you get it? If he can do that for an Old Testament prophet, he can do it for a New Testament king and priest. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, so, then he finally says, <clears throat> For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say, whosoever shall say, unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Verse 23 is about speaking. Verse 24. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. 
Verse 23 is about speaking. Verse 24 is about praying, right? Get them both right. So why, now last thing, why did Jesus have faith in God that God would uphold Jesus' words? I give you two scriptures. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. You get it? Jesus was simply obeying and walking in what God provided for Adam. Why? Because he was the last Adam. He was doing everything the way the first Adam should have done it, but didn't. Right? So he wasn't going by a specific word. He was going by the fact that he was walking as God's man on this earth in right relationship with God. So if you are in right relationship with God, how do you know if you are? You made Jesus Lord of your life. Are you in Christ? You're in right relationship. Amen? You may not be doing everything right, but if anything is not working in your life, it's not God's fault. It's because you're not working it the way it was meant to be worked. Right? You're believing something <clears throat> that does not allow God to do mighty works through you. Right? Now, I could, we could go on all kinds of examples. The last verse, Psalm 8, verse 3, When I consider the heavens, thy heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you are mindful of him, and the son of man, that you visit him. You notice he didn't say, what is a prophet? What is an apostle? What is he didn't say that. He said, what is man? Just man. Man has this ability. Not apostles, not prophets. That, that just gives you more responsibility. It does not give you more power. Your, your faith in, listen, faith in God, with, with faith in God, all things are possible. So, why do you, it's not a matter of more power. It's more faith. Amen? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angel that has crowned him with glory and honor. You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Man. And now we're in Christ. We are in the position God wanted Adam to walk in. Because of that, well, he has put us in Christ over all the works of his hands. The works of his hands for Jesus here was a fig tree. But guess what? It was also the blind it was also the maimed. It was also the sick. And whatever he put his hands to was blessed. Have faith in God. Let, trust God to back you up. You know, my dad was a policeman all my, you know, all my life, you know, until he passed away, actually, uh, back in 2011. And one of the main things that we used to talk about, because we talked about the legalities of Scripture and how the legal system works, and, and one of the things I asked him, I said, we were talking about authority and walking authority. And I said, but what if I'm an authority, but I make a mistake? How, how does that work? And my dad said, well, he said, actually, there's a law. He said that the system is that if, you, if a policeman, for instance, a policeman makes a wrongful arrest. He arrests the wrong guy, right? And, and when he goes to court, the policeman once that's proven, the policeman can't get sued. I said, he can't get sued? He said, yeah, even for wrongful arrest, the policeman can't get sued. The police department can get sued. The, 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 the city, the municipality, they can get sued. Why? Because he was operating as, a, as a, an official of that department. He was not operating under his own volition. He was operating in alignment with the position he had been put in. In that, so, it, so it was actually the police department, the city, that would be wrong. And I said, even if, it's, even if it's a wrong arrest, he said, as long as he can show good faith. I thought, good faith? He said, yeah, as long as you... In other words, if he did, if he thought this person was the person that did the crime based on the description or whatever it was, and if he did, if he arrested them, and if he could prove that any other person, any other policeman or anybody else would have made the same mistake, nothing could be done to him personally. Now think about that. All you have to do with God 
You are, you are a son or daughter of the living God. You are in Him. You are in Christ. The, the power of the kingdom of God is behind you, 100% to back you up. And even if you make a mistake, think about that. Even if you do it wrong, let's say you just somehow heal the wrong person, right? <laughs> if that were possible. But you make a mistake, then if it's a reasonable mistake, and if it's a mistake made in good faith, you were trying to do the right thing. Nowadays, they even have what's called the Good Samaritan Law. Because people would stop and try to help somebody in an accident, and the person, sometimes what they would do would be bad and hurt them more, and people were getting sued. So they put a law in effect called the Good Samaritan Law that says if you stop to help somebody and your intent is to truly help, and if you make a mistake, then you can't be sued because of it. Think about that. And isn't it funny they had to go back to the Bible to get a term for that law? Why? Because the Mosaic law and the Bible, biblical law, is the basis of all law in the United States, which is one of the main things that sets the United States against, uh, you know, sets them apart of most other nations. Now, I'm not saying how well it's always acted out, but I'm saying the way it was designed. So even if you make a mistake, God is for you. What can separate you from him? from his love, from his desire to see you fulfill and be con conformed to the image of Christ. So even, the, the key is the biggest mistake you'll make is to not try to help somebody. Amen? Amen. Even if you make a mistake, I, I'm, I know there are mistakes Paul made and Peter that they did things that was not the will of God and yet you can see that God backed them up even in their mistakes. Trust God to back you up. Trust God to keep your words from falling to the ground. When you say, when you pray, trust God to bring it to pass. He is behind you. He wants you. He wants you to fulfill your divine destiny. Why? Because when you do, it glorifies Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, if you pray in my name, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Why? So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You get it? It ain't about you. It's about God being glorified through Jesus living in you and, be, and you being able, being able to do what he did. It brings glory to the Father. Amen? amen. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, I, amen. Well, I can tell you, I had a good time preaching it. I enjoyed it. I'm going to get a copy and listen to it myself. Right? <laughs> so, Father, we thank you. Your word is true. We thank you, Father, that all that you have for us is ours and that now, Father, we know to look to your word, find out all that is in your will for us and let us so that we can walk in the fullness of our inheritance that was provided through the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So Father, in Jesus' name, we bless these people. We bless those listening to us. We say in the name of Jesus right now, sickness and disease, you have to go. You will leave them and never return. All pain, sickness, ailments, addictions, Right now, go in Jesus' name. We set them free in Jesus' name. And right now, just check that out. Begin to move whatever it was you couldn't do before. If you couldn't breathe, breathe whatever it was. Begin to do what you couldn't do before. Now, if Jesus, if you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, now's the time to do it. Do it right now. Don't wait. Right now, jump in. Make him Lord of your life. You say, how do I do that? Just say, Jesus, you are the Lord and I, right now, I make you my Lord. I will find out your will. I will obey your will. And I thank you now that I receive forgiveness of my sins, cleansing, and I am now a new creation. All you have to do is anything along those lines. It's not the words. It's the intent of your heart that you are submitting yourself to God through Jesus Christ. And at that moment, you become born again. And everything I've been talking about instantly becomes your inheritance. Matter of fact, that and even more that we hadn't even had time to talk about today. So do it now. If you made Jesus Lord of your life, write us, call us, let us know. We want to rejoice with you and we got some material we want to be able to send to you also. So until next time, God bless you. We will see y'all later.